From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan. David Feldman is not with us today. He's very busy boycotting the Washington Correspondents' Dinner and instead is holding a rally in his one-bedroom apartment. So we all look forward to hearing how that turned out. But, of course, we have the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello. How are you, Steve and Jimmy? We have a very powerful program today. We do, as as we usually do. And on the show today, we're going to talk about the plight of adjunct professors, a class of the working poor that many of us are probably not aware of, and the consequences uh, their plight has for the quality of higher education. And we're also going to talk about public banks, Is that a solution for the too-big-to-fail private banks? As always, we will find out the latest monkey shines going on in the boardrooms of corporate America with Russell Mokhyber, the Father Brown of the corporate crime beat. And then after that, we're going to talk a little bit with Ralph about the first 100 days of the Trump administration and specifically about his tax plan. Now, usually we think of temp workers as secretarial workers or blue-collar construction workers. But believe it or not, this also can apply to university professors. They are called adjunct professors, and like other types of temp work, it's hard to support oneself and get benefits, which brings us to our first guest. Maria Maisto is on the board of the New Faculty Majority, which is an organization dedicated to improving the quality of higher education by advancing professional equity and securing academic freedom for all adjunct and contingent faculty. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Maria Maisto. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Welcome indeed, Maria. You've been at this for a a number of years. Let's tell our listeners how gigantic the number is of adjunct faculty, or what are often called contingent faculty, at community colleges and four-year colleges today. Right. So now we have about 70, probably about 71 percent of all faculty in higher education are basically temporary workers. A few years ago, the high number was about 75%, but now it seems to have come down just a little bit. Part-timers, who are the classic adjunct faculty that most people recognize and understand, are at about 40%. Grad students, whom we count as adjunct or contingent faculty, are at about 13.7%. And then full-time non-tenure track faculty, who are sort of a middle tier of full-time but not allowed to have access to tenure are slowly increasing at right now about 16.7%. So so still the vast majority of the faculty. The vast majority also are very poor. I don't think people realize how little they get for teaching a course or courses. Apart from, you know, the lawyer or the accountant who have their own professional remuneration at their firms uh, teaching a stray course or there. We're talking about a huge segment of our working population that goes without. And I want you to enumerate what that means, going without. First, indicate what the average pay for a semester course is by an adjunct teacher. And then what are they denied compared to full-time faculty? Sure. So the latest figures that we have, and I have to say that it's often difficult to collect this information because colleges and universities, as you might expect, are loath to let this information be known publicly. But the latest information that we have is about $2,700 per course. It's more in unionized environments. That amounts to probably twenty dollars to $25,000 a year for adjuncts who are teaching sometimes at multiple institutions trying to put some kind of full-time work together to live on. Very few adjuncts, unless they're unionized, have access to health benefits, although they have been able to get access to it thanks to the Affordable Care Act in many cases. No access to retirement benefits in many cases. So in terms of the benefits that you would expect employees to receive, there's a lot of difficulty in getting access to those benefits. In terms of the professional supports that we expect professors to have, and most people don't realize this, adjunct faculty are also very much at a disadvantage because they often get assigned their courses 
at the last minute, so they don't have time to prepare. They're often denied a role in curriculum decisions and faculty governance. They don't have academic freedom protections, which are what, which is what tenure is meant to protect. So in many cases, they have to be very careful about what they say and do in the classroom because a bad student evaluation or a hostile colleague or supervisor could simply make it so that they're not renewed. And they're rarely fired. They're simply not renewed. That's the vast majority. That's really the way that they get fired. They often... Uh, very few have access to professional development funds, so they don't get a chance to go to conferences where they can learn about the latest developments in their academic disciplines. And, of course, trying to publish, which is something that many would like to be able to do, it's important to the profession, is something that they often are not able to do. So this results, obviously, in real difficulties that have an effect on students. One other fact of many adjuncts professional life is that they don't have access to private offices which may sound like a little bit of whining on their part but actually it has to do with the need for students to have access to their professors in private because federal law is supposed to guarantee students privacy FERPA laws to make sure that they can talk about their academic and often personal situations with their professors and that is often violated on many many campuses you're striving for equity you want equity and compensation equal pay for equal work with full-time faculty you're striving for unemployment compensation which adjunct faculty don't have you're striving for benefits, equity and benefits, like the same health insurance and retirement benefits. Uh, I don't think people realize that this redounds to the disadvantage of students as well. I and mean, we have a surf class here. One of your colleagues in this movement once said that Walmart treats its workers better than adjunct professors at colleges and universities. And these universities and colleges are, you know, always touted as being uh, leaning liberal, if not progressive, and that they uh, teach students about the history of the working class. How far have you gotten any unionization in at any large university like Ohio State or UCLA? Well, actually, fortunately, there has been a very vibrant organizing movement among adjunct faculty, especially in the last several years. So adjuncts have been unionizing for several decades, and they're about 20% unionized. But in the last several years, thanks to a number of unions, both academic unions like AAUP and AFT and NEA, but also non-traditionally academic unions like the steelworkers and SEIU and the auto workers and communication workers have, have really entered have really stepped up their organizing efforts, so we're probably closer to 25% unionized adjunct faculty across the country. And my understanding is that about 88% of adjunct elections are won, which is very different from what happens in union elections in other states. Are these organizing drives usually opposed by the university or college administration, and what's the attitude of full-time faculty toward this organizing? Yeah. So we've seen a lot of very disheartening union-busting activity by a lot of colleges and universities. Some of the most egregious has been by Catholic colleges and universities that are going flat in the face of Catholic social teaching. That's been particularly appalling. But there, there have been a few administrations. Georgetown actually took a pretty healthy attitude towards the adjuncts unionizing there. Full-time faculty and tenured faculty have become more and more supportive, but there are definitely still some tensions and fissures in the relationship between tenure line faculty and contingent faculty, which we're working hard to try to address because we really feel that there ought to be more solidarity. And, and fortunately, I think more and more tenure line faculty are coming to understand that contingency is coming for them if they don't start supporting the adjunct unionization efforts and the organizing efforts as we try to save the flow of the move to contingent employment. Well, yeah, and uh, of course, there is a right-wing assault now on the concept of tenured faculty. Absolutely. They want to get rid of that, 
and uh, they have an administration in Washington that I'm sure is in support of that with Betsy DeVos as Secretary of Education under Donald Trump. But, you know, in recent years, there have been uh, activities by the students themselves to try to raise the minimum wages of administrative staff, people who serve in the you know, college cafeteria, people who clean up in various buildings. Has there been a convergence between the, the, the student effort to uh, support higher than $7 and a quarter or $8 an hour minimum wage for these administrative blue-collar workers and your drive and your movement for equity for uh, adjunct faculty? Any collaboration there? Yeah, absolutely. We have been most successful, I think, when we have forged those kinds of relationships and collaborations with students because students, when they find out about the working conditions of their faculty, because 50% or more of all college courses are being taught by contingent faculty, when students discover that either their favorite professors or the ones that they, uh, that they are really benefiting from are being treated this way. They, they become indignant and they want to get involved. And by the same token, when they realize that sometimes adjuncts are not able to do all that they would like to be able to do for them, like be able to have office hours and things like that, they understand that the problem is not the adjuncts, but the, the problem is systemic and structural and that it's the working conditions of adjuncts. So students are often the most inspiring members of the movement and often help inspire faculty who are sometimes a little bit reluctant or embarrassed or ashamed about their working conditions and not willing to take action. And, and oftentimes it's the students that really help give them the impetus they need to do that. I also think that the work of students like Students Against Sweatshops, the work that students have done to raise awareness about the working conditions of campus labor and labor practices across the country have helped us also to forge some relationships with other members of the low-wage worker movement. So that's been do you, very... Do you find, Maria, we're talking with Maria Maisto, who is a longtime organizer, teacher herself, and has been indefatigable in making connections with all kinds of other institutions, higher education institutions, labor unions, to get more recognition of the equitable rights of, well, nearly 800,000 adjunct faculty, uh, about 70% or more of all teachers at community colleges and universities. Some of these universities have big-time college newspapers. I'm talking about University of Florida, for example, has a big-time newspaper, and they come out even more than once a week. Some of them come out twice a week. Do they give you front-page treatment from time to time about the plight of adjunct faculty, because a lot of adjunct faculty are afraid to speak up. As you've said, they can simply be not renewed. Right. Yeah, actually, when student journalists have become aware of the problem, again, they've been very good about reporting on it, and so we've been very grateful for that. Of course, one of the challenges in working with students is that you get a whole new crop of students from every year and and so it's a constant education process but it's good because it makes it makes the students more aware of how ongoing the problem has been and what the progress is on trying to address these issues well one way the students can bring it to the whole campus community's attention is to show the hierarchy of pay i mean a lot of universities are basically plutocratically organized the football coach may make two three four million dollars a year even more now for some of the big time programs. The university presidents are now up there, hundreds of thousand dollars, a number of them well over a million dollars a year. The administrators, like the University of California, Berkeley, are extremely well paid, even compared to the tenured professors. I think it's important to further the equitable cause of 800,000 uh, adjunct faculty to show the inequity in terms of the way the university dollars are allocated from the top down. Do you make a big point of that, or is that sort of off limits? No, it's definitely not off limits. It's definitely a point we try to make, and there's data to, to back it up. This is one of the facts that often really galvanizes folks on campus to, to get active. We also know that the research is showing that the arguments that these universities and colleges make 
that they're trying to save money and that they're supposedly passing on these savings to students are really not accurate. And there was a recent report that, that really showed that the use of adjunct faculty is not resulting in cost savings for students. It's actually simply that the costs are shifting not just to administrators, but actually also to marketing. My daughter has spent the last year applying to colleges, and the marketing, the amount of money that goes into college marketing is really, it's really shocking. But yeah, the shift has been pronounced, and it's increasingly difficult, I think, for colleges and universities to justify it, especially as, as it gets known. So we need a lot more transparency. And I think that when the public starts to demand to know what these salaries are, how the costs are being allocated, I think that's going to help a lot. I do want to make one point, though, that some of the costs have gone to student services, support for students with disabilities, support for a lot of really necessary on-campus services. So one of the things I think we have to do as a campus community is integrate the services with the academics in ways that you know we used to do at colleges and universities but has really become sort of fragmented and unbundled in ways that aren't helpful for students mm. and, and this would also help create more solidarity between staff on campus, academic and support staff on campus and faculty. Well, you know, certainly the conditions for uh, students with disabilities is far improved compared to when I went to school. We never saw students with disabilities that they didn't have the ability to surmount stairs nobody cared for them in fact I had a friend when I was a freshman at Princeton who injured himself and he couldn't get from one part of the campus to another on crutches and there was no wheelchair capability and no way to have him get up the stairs to the classroom and he had to drop out so there are real advances, a lot more to be done, but there are real advances for students with disabilities. But, Maria, you're known to control your level of moral indignation, so let me unleash some of mine. I think it's pretty outrageous that the people who get the most pay have no contact with students. They don't teach students. These are the football coaches, athletic programs, for example. That's normally not what people go to universities and colleges for, but it's eating into budgets. Most of these programs lose money. They're in red ink and have to be subsidized by other university budgets. You have the presidents making tons of money. They're not doing any teaching. You have the administrators making tons of money. They're not doing any teaching. The only people who are doing teaching are the teachers, and the adjunct professors are at the bottom of the totem pole. What kind of perverse inversion of priorities is this, and how can we really make this an extraordinary high visible situation. I think you can foresee that the Betsy DeVos controlled Department of Education is going to be more offensive than ever against the rights of the adjunct faculty. How do you up the ante? How would you raise the visibility, make candidates take a position on this, get the AFL CIO more mobilized as a federation on this? Well, I think one of the things that really has to happen is that people have to understand that professors, teachers, are workers, they're labor. And so there's sort of a, an artificial distinction, I think, that's sometimes made between the situation of adjunct faculty as an academic issue and, and it being a labor issue and a justice issue. The operating principle that we use is that faculty working conditions are student learning conditions. And I think it's really important for people to understand that connection and how it affects students, especially the most disadvantaged students who really need the most sustained contact with their faculty. And we also have to understand the way that this system disproportionately affects faculty who are women, who are people of color, who are older faculty, who are faculty with disabilities, because they're the ones who are often the most exploited and who are in the most difficult positions. Just a few weeks ago, I lost a very dear friend and colleague, and a fellow adjunct professor who was 61 in a tragic shooting in Cleveland. He was an adjunct who worked at multiple campuses, was barely making a living, and when he died, his family had to start a GoFundMe to pay for his final expenses. 
so this is very much a justice issue on many, many levels, and I think it's important for people to understand in that way, not just because of the, the human cost, but also because, you know, we've sort of lost sight of the, the purpose of higher education as being to teach students about democracy, about civic engagement, about their rights and responsibilities as citizens and the structural conditions for adjunct faculty at colleges and universities really reflect that disregard for the rights, for the basic rights of workers, of teachers, of students. And, you know, because when you have professors on campus who are afraid to challenge students or to teach students about controversial subjects or to teach about the labor movement or about what their rights are, then that does a disservice to those students and to the country as a whole. Well, this has been going on for a long time. The universities and colleges teach democracy in their political science courses, but the institution the students are a part of practice autocracy. Not that the students should rule the roost, but they should be given more voice and more due process and encouraged to put in what their ideas and what suggestions they have in the overall discussion with other segments of the staff and administration, and not to mention the Board of Trustees, which meets in private and almost never invites right. students to meet the Board of Trustees, who are the ultimate rulers of those educational institutions. Maria, before we bring in Steve Scrovan into this discussion in our concluding moments, tell our listeners how they can connect with your movement to try to get equity and voice and security for about 800,000 adjunct faculty at community colleges and four-year colleges. Absolutely. Thank you. So our website is at newfacultymajority.org. And we are also on Facebook and Twitter. But what I would encourage people to do also is to really look at their local colleges and universities or their alma maters and be the people who confront those colleges and universities, ask the tough questions, find out where organizing drives are happening and support them, make college and university administrators and legislators know that you won't stand for this. I mean, this is a movement not just of adjunct faculty, but indeed of students and of workers and of community members who should all be working together because higher education is, is critical to our democracy and, mm -hmm. and to our future. Well, this is a good suggestion. The alumni can weigh in here. Yeah. They can weigh in in terms of their communications when they're always asked for money by their alma maters, but they can also weigh in at reunions because reunions are high visibility. If you get alumni at reunions at the various universities and colleges revved up here, I can assure you that the administration of these colleges will get a different kind of urgent message. Steve Scorvan, do you have any comment or question? Yeah, well, what's going through my mind is what my union is going through right now. I'm, I'm in the Writers Guild of America, as is David, and we're going through a collective bargaining. And what seems analogous is that if 71% of faculty is adjunct professors, just like the writers, we're creating the content for the market. And just like you are, the adjunct professors are creating the actual education and are not easily replaced by a machine. So I, I would think you would have a, you know, that would be the, the point really to make is that without you, where are they? That's right. That's absolutely right. We had a national adjunct walkout day in early 2015 but it's often difficult to get people to participate. And what I really think is that we need to get all faculty to participate, not just adjunct faculty, but also tenure-line faculty and students to do a massive walkout to protest these conditions. And that's certainly something that we keep talking about, we keep trying to work for, and I think we're further along than we ever have been in the movement. Do you think the, the real danger on the horizon is distance learning? You know, over the Internet, they get these yeah. prominent professors and they can teach courses across colleges and universities, thousands of students. Is that a looming threat to all faculty, not just adjunct faculty? You know, it, a few years ago, people thought that it was, but they tried it in California, and it really pretty much fizzled out because students want face-to-face -face contact with their professors. 
And the best learning, everybody knows that the best learning happens in that kind of one-on-one, in-person contact. So while it's always there as a threat, I don't think it's as looming or dangerous as it might have seemed a few years ago. But it doesn't mean that we shouldn't always also be on our guard because there are constant efforts to bring in all sorts of shiny new technology and people can be seduced by that. And I think we have to really work to to stand our ground and stand for what we know works in quality education, especially for the most disadvantaged students who, who really rely and depend on education to help them survive. Mm. Well, thank you, Maria Maestro, for coming on our program. And before we close, once more, give our listeners the contact information to your group and what you'd like them to do to help. Absolutely. Newfacultymajority.org. If you can support us with financial donations, we're We'd be thrilled and grateful, but most importantly, get yourself educated about what's happening at colleges and universities and speak up, use your voice, support the students and the faculty, especially as community members and alumni, because we need everyone to come together around this issue. Thank you, Maria Maestro. We really have to put our priorities in order in terms of how money is spent in colleges and universities around the country. To be continued, this is not going to go away, and certainly your efforts, efforts of your colleagues have been formidable since 2009 when this movement got underway in a more formal manner, although there were courageous precursors who raised this issue many years ago. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for bringing attention to this issue for us. You're very welcome. We have been speaking to Maria Maisto of the New Faculty Majority. We will link to that at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. Oh, Russell. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your corporate crime reporter morning minute for Friday, April 21, 2017. I'm Russell Mokhyber. The medical device maker St. Jude Medical played down the failure of some batteries in its defibrillators shipping them for years before recalling the devices last fall. That's according to a report in the New York Times. The company, acquired by Abbott Labs in January, also failed to tell its own management and a medical advisory board that the battery problems had led to the death of a patient the Food and Drug Administration found. The FDA said St. Jude Medical had not shown it was taking sufficient action to fix the problem that led to the slow recall and ordered the company to provide new reporting plans within 15 days. Faulty defibrillators and other implanted devices are particularly problematic because removing them requires surgery that can be more risky than keeping them in. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Now, last week we had a listener question about alternatives to putting your money into two big-to-fail banks. Ralph mentioned public banking as one possible answer to that problem. And this week, we have a guest who is an expert on that very topic. Ellen Brown is an attorney and the founder of the Public Banking Institute, whose vision is to establish a network of state and local publicly owned banks that create affordable credit while providing a sustainable alternative to the current high-risk centralized private banking system. Ms. Brown is the author of a dozen books, including Web of Debt and The Public Bank Solution, and she's joining us today from... Basel, Switzerland. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Ellen Brown. Uh, Thank you very much. Yes, welcome again, Ellen. You're on the move everywhere. You're the great advocate of public banking and its interest, of course, in Europe and elsewhere. But we have a state bank for many years, almost 100 years, in North Dakota. And it's been a model for people who want state banks from California to New Jersey as this effort begins to turn into a higher level of activity, particularly in California where you live and work, Alan Brown. So why don't we start out with the model to see how successful it's been compared to the speculative giant banks in New York City who are too big to fail and therefore they're bailed out by the U.S. taxpayer, as was shown in trillions of dollars during the 2008-2009 Wall Street crash, which, by the way, unemployed 8 million workers and shredded pension funds and mutual funds to a disastrous degree for the hard-pressed owners of these savings. Why don't you start describing the state bank of North Dakota? 
Well, in 2014, I think it was November of 2014, the Wall Street Journal came out with an article that said that the Bank of North Dakota was actually more profitable than J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. In fact, it had a return on equity that was 70% higher than those two banks, which was remarkable. The article attributed it to oil, but after that, we've had an oil bust. Oil totally collapsed, and in North Dakota, the Bank of North Dakota has still, for the last 12 years, every year reported greater profits than the previous year. So they had their best year ever last year so far, and they're still making 1% or 2% loans to or they're making 2% infrastructure loans, for example, to local school districts for medical purposes, hospitals, and agriculture, the various sectors that they support. And they make, I think they're at something like 1.6% for student loans. Anyway, they're making quite low-cost loans for the local community. They partner with the local banks. So here's the model. They've been there for, they've been around for since 1919, when the farmers in North Dakota were losing their farms to the Wall Street bankers, or not Wall Street, it was actually, I think they were in Minneapolis, but anyway, big out-of-state bankers. And so they wanted to keep their money in-state. They're very conservative. They're still very, you know, it's a very conservative state. So it was not about socialism. It was about state sovereignty. They wanted their money in their state. They, so they, they had a movement. It was the nonpartisan, they formed this political party called the Nonpartisan League. They won an election and got their bank instituted and also a state granary instituted because at that time the bank and the railroad and the granary were basically all one system. So you're forced to take your grain to this out-of-state granary which went on an out-of-state railroad and it was all owned by out-of-state banks. And so that's how they were captured. So they were redoing the system themselves. So they won an election, got this bank started, and it's been around for now for nearly 100 years, and it's been exceedingly successful. I mean, it had a, of course, it had a rocky start. They had to fight the bankers, and they had trouble getting the capital together because they were trying to get the capital from the very people that were their competitors. But they did manage to get this, the bank up and running, and it has been very successful. So the model is that by law, all of the state's revenues are deposited in the bank. So they have a massive deposit bank base. And by now, of course, they've built up a very large capital base as well. I think they have something like $7.4 billion in assets and 10% of that in capital. But originally, it was capitalized on a bond issue. But they also, by law, it's set up as North Dakota doing business as the Bank of North Dakota. So technically, the bank is part of the government, so they're actually technically backed by the government. And they, rather than competing with the local banks, they partner with the local banks, and they've advised other people inquiring about this model. If you want to set up a state bank in your own state, don't try to compete with your local banks. What you want to do is join them. It's basically the local banks against the Wall Street banks. So they partner with the local banks, which are sort of like the front office, which go out and find the loans and deal with the customers and so forth. And then they participate in the loans, share the proceeds. So they're very helpful to the local bankers. And they, they, there are more, I think there are six times as many banks per capita in North Dakota as in any other state. They haven't lost any banks in all this time during the banking crisis when other states have been the, the local banking sector has been shrinking radically. Yeah, well, let's shift to California, where, where there's real activity. Where does the money come from, first of all, for the capital base of a proposed state bank of California, you know, like the, uh, the state pensions, et cetera? Let's, let's briefly talk about where the money can come from to provide the base for a state bank before we talk about the enormous savings to taxpayers and other beneficiaries? Well, you could do it like North Dakota did it, which would be a bond issue sold to the public. The problem with that is every state now is up against their own debt ceilings. They're all supposed to balance their budgets. They don't have the option of going further and further in debt like the federal government does. So it's difficult to persuade legislators to go further in debt 
to capitalize a bank. So my proposal is to get it from the pension funds. The California California has five hundred billion dollars in their pension funds that are always looking for good investments. They want seven percent return. So we could say, fine, we'll give you seven percent return. This is the publicly owned pension funds, Calpers and Calsters. So if the entity, the state bank, gives the pension funds the seven percent that they want, you're still giving the money to state entities, so this is still going to the pensioners, et cetera. It's good for everybody. It's not going out of state. So you can give them 7%, and you can still turn a nice profit because then get your deposits. California, well, this is my proposal. California has an investment pool, of treasurer's investment pool, where they manage all the investments from different agencies around the state, also all public money, publicly, you know, state-owned money, publicly-owned money that has, I think, about $70 billion in it now, making, it was, when I first started writing about it, it was making 0.23% interest, but I think it's now up to, it's above half a percent interest, but it's still making almost nothing. So so pay them what they're getting now. It, you pull that, a certain, let's say you start with a billion-dollar bank, so you could get a billion dollars from the pension funds, then you can pull $10 billion or make it $11 billion out of the deposit pool, pay them the same interest that they're getting now, or the same return that they're getting now. So if you multiply that out, this allows you to lend 10 times $1 billion. So you can lend $10 billion, and the money is still there in the bank. That's the way a bank works. So you're, let's say you made loans at ordinary infrastructure loans at something like 4%. Or, you know, typical, or you can make all sorts of loans. You can make 2% infrastructure loans to local governments and you'll still turn a profit. But let's say you, ma- you were making ordinary 5% loans. Five times 10, you've got, you're making 50% right there. And then you deduct half a percent times 10. So that's 5%. And then another 7% for the pension fund. So that's 12 from 50, you've got you're just you've just made 38 percent return, and all the money's going back to state entities. I mean, it's your cost of funds is to yourself. So the whole thing is a win-win-win for all participants. And when the, to put it another way, in California now, the California state government puts its money, various pools of money, pension money, other operating cash balances, into uh, let's say, Wall Street banks, and then they have to borrow from these Wall Street banks to provide the money to repair the bridges and the highways and the public schools and the drinking water systems, sewage systems, what's called the infrastructure. And in the meantime, the Wall Street banks are gouging them. They're charging them huge fees. They're charging them what you claim is double what it would be charged by a state bank of California. And they also are fooling around with these risky derivatives. And who knows how scary the lack of security of this whole operation. When you get a city group and Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase and others operating, they're still in this risky derivatives business. So what you're saying is uh, that to repair or renovate or expand the public works of California, how much will the savings be in percentage? Uh, I don't know. So the cost of you, borrowing, in other words. Oh, right. Okay. So if you're funding it yourself, it's your own bank, and you're funding your own state infrastructure, you're going to cut your costs in half because interest is accepted to be 50% on average the cost of infrastructure. So, But if you're doing something like loans to local communities for their infrastructure, like the Bank of North Dakota does, they're making 2% loans versus 4 to 6% for infrastructure loans in other states. I mean, typically, so let's say around 5% for an infrastructure loan versus 2% in North Dakota. So if you're a local community, you can get your money for less than half price. And if you're the state itself, you can get the whole project for half of what it would have cost originally. You see what I mean? You're making a loan. If you're making a loan to yourself, using, leveraging your own funds, then all the profits go back to you. 
if you're making a loan to the local community, then the interest is going to go back to the state. But it's still one large entity. It's all the public. Ellen Brown, how similar would the state bank be to a regular commercial bank in California? I know this, can consumers go in there? Can they deposit their money? Can they have a checking account? Can they get a home equity loan? The way you framed it, it's not quite like that. And, and there isn't that kind of direct competition with the local commercial banking system. Right. Well, in North Dakota, they have 2 or 3% individual depositors, and they did that just because they figured, well, we're a public bank, we should make it open to the public. But they actually make it very difficult to bank there. There's a, originally, there was only one branch, right, in the capital city. Now, I guess they've opened another branch, but they don't have ATM machines. Basically, you have to just walk in to do your banking right there in the local branch. So it's not real appealing to individuals. But what they recommend or what we recommend is that not to take individual deposits at all because then you don't have to worry about FDIC insurance or this sort of demand for mortgages and so forth. What you want to do is partner with the local banks and help them to make all those loans that the, right now they're not actually able to make. They want the business. They want to cater to the local businesses and the local homeowners and so forth, but they don't have the range. Right now, their regulations are very heavily coming down on the local banks. Many people say it's very difficult to get a mortgage. You walk in and they require so much paperwork and they're so nervous about the whole thing because of these new regulations. So another model, incidentally, is in Germany with the Sparkasm banks. And in Germany, it's a, half of their commercial banking is through these local Sparkasm banks, um, publicly owned, publicly mandated to serve the public, and they just serve their local communities. And part of their network is that they help the local banks with all these regulations that are coming down from the EU. So that's what you can do is have your state bank, among other services it would offer to the local banks, would be to help them with these very onerous regulations that are putting the banks out of business. Well, you know, this is going to take a lot of public education. I hope that the State Bank of North Dakota, which is run by very reserved North Dakota managers, will start traveling around the country and talking directly from their almost 100 years of stunningly successful and frugal experience. But Governor Jerry Brown has not bought into your idea. And while there may be a bill in the California legislature in Sacramento, without his support, it's not going to go anywhere. Why does he still insist on borrowing from Wall Street, getting gouged with the fees, and feeding this risky, plutocratic giant? Well, I have heard through the grapevine that he's not opposed. Originally, we had a bill that passed both houses of the California legislature, which was for really? a hmm. study, a feasibility study, and Jerry oh. Brown vetoed it, saying that we don't need another feasibility study, which a blue ribbon committee, which costs extra money. He said, we've already got a banking committee. We can do this in-house. But, of course, they never did it. But allegedly, so I've heard, he's open to the possibility. But the problem we've run into, like you say, it takes education. The politicians are generally not bankers. The politicians who get it and who really get excited about this idea are the ones who are bankers. For example, the Phil Murphy, who's running for governor of New Jersey and is the leading Democratic contender. He was a Wall Street banker, and he jumped at the idea as soon as he heard it. He said, I could make that bank profitable because he understood how banking works. But I've heard three different treasurers or former treasurers or treasury departments say, we don't have the money to lend. We need our revenues for our budget. But that misunderstands how banking works. They're putting their money right now into a Wall Street bank, which is technically or considered to be lending that money out. The Wall Street Bank is doing exactly what we're proposing the state bank would do. But as we now know, banks do not actually lend their deposits, and that's how they get away with all this. They actually create deposits in their books when they make a loan. They just write it into the deposit account, and they can get away with that because they are in charge of deposits, and most people can't tell the difference between deposits that are written into the account and ones that came from somewhere else. And even the ones that did come from somewhere else, they came from some other bank that they created them in that very same way. 
So they're all creating this loan money that then goes into another bank. So the books are supposed to balance at the end of the day. And if they're lucky, maybe another bank will have made the same kind of loans they've made. And like, let's say you make a $500,000 mortgage and that check finds its way into another bank. You've got to cover that check. But that bank might have made it also done a $500,000 mortgage that wanders into your bank. So both books balance, but you've just created a million dollars that wasn't there before. And if the books don't balance at the end of the day, they only have to balance at night. And then the next day they can be unbalanced all day long. So what they do is they borrow just overnight in the overnight market, repo market, which is very cheap. They can borrow Fed funds, but they hardly do that anymore, borrowing from each other. What they do is they borrow on the repo market or from the federal home loan banks, which are even cheaper. Uh, Ellen, you've just demonstrated how hard it is to engage in public education on this idea. (laughs) And I think it would be much more effective is to start out with the savings that come to the taxpayer and to people who have public pensions, such as the $500 billion of total state-owned or trustee money in California. So you start out with that basis. Once you get into, you know, Economics 101 at Yale and how banks create money in terms of extending credit, you're going to lose people. So tell us two things. One, how they can get in touch with you and your organization in California to get more information in plain English. And second, what are the states where the idea of a state bank is percolating in addition to California and New Jersey? Okay, so my website is webofdebt.com. Well, webofdebtwordpress.com or ellenbrown.com. And the Public Banking Institute is at publicbankinginstitute.org. That's publicbankinginstitute.org. We'll go to the books you've read and the articles. You've presented this idea at all levels of extension and compression for people to read. And you've testified a lot on this. And then indicate which states it's starting to percolate. So people who are listening to this program might be in those states. Okay. Well, California, as you mentioned, and New Jersey and New Mexico, Arizona, Oregon, Washington State, Michigan. Uh, We've counted like 50 different groups around the country that are pushing their local legislators for publicly owned banks. How about Alaska, which has a permanent fund that provides anywhere from $1,500 $1,500 to $1,800 normally to every child, woman, and man in Alaska coming out of the oil revenues. And how about my home state of Connecticut? Anything going on there? Actually, you would have to ask Walt, this, the PBI chairman, because I'm not quite sure. Connecticut, I'm not sure about that. Alaska, I've received emails from people in Alaska asking, inquiring, and I've sent information up there, but I'm not just sure. Again, I'm not really in charge of what's going on, you know, all the networking going on. I'm basically just the writer. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you, Ellen Brown. We've been speaking with Ellen Brown, an attorney who heads the Public Banking Institute. You can reach her website by going to the publicbankinginstitute.org. And this is going to be a continuing issue. I can see it's rising around the country to challenge the rapacity of these giant New York banks who still are too big to fail, meaning you, the taxpayer, will bail them out again. Thank you, Alan Brown. Thank you. It's great talking to you. We've been speaking to Ellen Brown, as Ralph said, author of The Public Bank Solution, who is coming to us from Switzerland, I thought ironically, from the home of the Swiss bank. She's coming to us from the belly of the beast. We will link to her work at RalphNaderRadioHour.com. So, Ralph, I just had a question about that last interview. So if I heard correctly, the public bank is not necessarily for individual depositors, Right. The public bank is to support other local banks. So it really isn't an alternative to Citibank or Wells Fargo or anything like that. It's an alternative to the way state funds are invested and gouged and rendered insecure. That's basically what the concept is in California. Although in the state of North Dakota, they do have consumer banking. It's been around almost 100 years and It's basically unchallengeable. It's part of the 
political economy fabric of North Dakota rooted in the farmers movement, which is still revered in North Dakota in spite of all its new oil derricks. Well, that, that sounds exciting out here in California where I am. And if Jerry Brown is not opposed to it, I mean, we have a proposition system out here. There could be a referendum. Has there been one here? Do you know? No, not at all. No. That could be one way to do it. It would be very costly, though, because all the banks would pour money into it and develop all kinds of scare tactics on television. But it could go right through the legislature. It's a Democratic Party-dominated, veto-proof legislature, and Jerry Brown could make it happen. But I don't think he's going to put his political influence behind it in his last two years in office. Right. Well, let's shift gears here and talk about our president, Donald Trump's first 100 days. Uh, We've talked a lot about Donald Trump over the last few months, but what's your take on his first 100 days? Well, I call it 100 days of Trumpian rage and rapacity. He is moving fast to dismantle the entire federal government's efforts on climate change. Very dangerous support by the Republican Party in Congress. In fact, Noam Chomsky's called the Republican Party one of the most dangerous institutions in the world because of that, among other things. He is continuing the belligerent foreign and military policy of Barack Obama and indeed may escalate it. He is rolling back to the extent that he has authority, the health and safety standards that save American lives and prevent injuries and disease. He wants to even cut the budget of the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta The part of the budget, guess which part? The part that deals with heading off devastating global epidemics, like from China or from Africa and elsewhere, avian flu or Ebola. So this is a ignorant, cruel, Wall Street-dominated regime in Washington. Thank you, Electoral College, that selected Donald Trump, who lost the popular vote to Hillary Clinton. And the Congress is controlled by the Republican Party, the most reactionary Republican Party in its history by far. And together with Donald Trump surrounding himself with Wall Street executives right into the White House next to the Oval Office, a former co-chair of Goldman Sachs is right next to him. We have a big problem here, and the people still have the power, and they've got to flood those town meetings create their own if the Republicans run away with chicken-like escape from meeting the people back home. And there are big recesses coming up, the Memorial Day recess and the huge August month recess. So go to indivisibleguide.com for the information about different congressional districts, town meetings, etc. that has been successful in getting people alert and encouraging them to show up. And a lot of these people are showing up. They're not all liberals and progressives. They're conservatives who feel betrayed by Donald Trump, who's broken all kinds of promises in a 100 days, and who feel that they, too, don't want to lose their health insurance, among other services that they desperately need for their families. Did you get a look at the preliminary uh, tax reform bill he's putting out? Yeah, this massive tax cut. It's just sort of like a soaring comet by Donald Trump. It's going to create, if it's passed, but it never will be, the biggest federal deficit in American history. Even the Republicans are quaking about being accused of having anything to do with cutting corporate taxes from a nominal 35 percent to 15 percent and cutting taxes on the rich as well. He'll have some tax cuts for what he calls the middle class, but the bulk of them will come out of the rich and the corporate. But it just shows, you know, that he's out of control. He's unstable. He doesn't know what he's doing. And the danger is that he will use firepower abroad, missiles and drones, et cetera, to engage in the kind of wag the dog military crisis that will distract attention and certainly distract the press from paying attention to his forthcoming domestic failures and disasters. I just heard a figure, and I don't know if this is exactly right, but the missiles that we hit Syria with recently, about $80 million worth of missiles? Well, if you include the backup, certainly. Look how that could be 
use back home. People might want to go to President Dwight Eisenhower's famous speech, which is online, April 1953, called the Cross of Iron speech, where he says, well, the U.S. can destroy the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union's got the weapons to destroy the U.S. Is that the way we want to live? I asked the people of America, and then he had conversion figures like, well, this battleship, if we don't build this battleship, we can build so many schools and so many roads and so many clinics, etc., from the bombers and the tanks. So you should go to that. It's on the Internet, President Dwight Eisenhower's Cross of Iron speech, April 1953. No other president has been so specific since that speech was rendered. Well, that's our show. I want to thank our guests today, Maria Mesto of the New Faculty Majority, and Ellen Brown, who talked to us about public banking. She's the author of The Public Bank Solution. A transcript of this episode will be posted on ralphnaderradiohour.com eventually when I'm able to get to it. For Ralph's weekly vlog, go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. Remember to visit the country's only law museum, the American Museum of Tort Law in Winstead, Connecticut. Go to tortmuseum.org. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin, our executive producers, Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. And join us next week. We're here every week, people, on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Talk to you then, Ralph. Thank you, Steve. And thank you, Jimmy. And listeners, if you like these programs week to week, get some other radio stations to pick them up or get your friends and neighbors who heard it in your community to go back home and get the radio stations to pick it up. Plenty of time on these stations. 90% or so are devoted to music, advertisement, and other such distractions. So there's plenty of time, and they're using our property, and you can just tell them, they got to recognize the 1934 Communications Act, which deals with public dissemination of information. Thank you again. Say you're just one person, and who will hear your voice? Don't let them fool you. You have the power in your hand. I'm only trying to school you.